Grace and peace. I'm Brian Lester, the Baptist Campus Minister at Drexel University, and this is Peace and Power Christian Fellowship, the peace of Jesus Christ to change your life, the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world. And we are continuing our series on the book of Acts, putting the kingdom of God on the map of the world. Um, we're looking at the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, and this is lesson two, and we are looking at Acts chapter two with the theme, the gospel is translatable into every language, and salvation is available to everyone. This is the third video of the lesson. And that video, um, the, the kind of the idea of it is just looking at how Peter presents salvation to his audience. And it's this inclusive gospel. So Luke's, in, in Luke's gospel, in the writing of Luke, um, especially with Simon's prophecy, which is Luke 2, 29 through 32, um, the quotation of Isaiah by the, John the Baptist in Luke 3, 4 through 6, and Jesus' introduction at Nazareth, Luke 4, 16 through 30, salvation to both Jew, the Jewish nation and to the entire Gentile world is the hope and goal of the gospel. But the Gospel of Luke only concentrates on Jesus' ministry to the Jews. Salvation for the Gentiles, although introduced in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, must wait to the second volume of the story, which is in Acts. So from the very beginning of his Gospel, Luke hints at Luke, engages this idea that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the salvation that will come through Jesus, will be available both to the nation of Israel and to the entire Gentile world. But although the Gospel of Luke looks at Jesus providing salvation to the nation of Israel, Jesus being the national Messiah of Israel, bringing forgiveness of sins to them, the second piece of that, the entire Gentile world, isn't until the second volume of Luke Acts and when Luke writes the book of Acts, we start getting into that theme, even though it was set up at the very beginning of Luke. Acts 2.11b, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now, many religions are tied to the languages in which they originated. Hebrew is still important for Judaism. Arabic is still essential for Islam. But Christianity from its birth at Pentecost was designed to be translated into multiple languages. Luke sees the events at Pentecost as the historical undoing of the Tower of Babel. Instead of God miraculously intervening to bring confusion through multiple languages, which is Babel, God through the Holy Spirit miraculously intervenes to bring understanding through multiple languages. So the birth of the church the first time the gospel is shared, the first time that even before the scripture was recorded, even before the gospels were written down, the first presentation of the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection to the public, the first offering of salvation to the public outside of Jesus' 120 followers in the upper room, this first time that the church proclaimed the gospel, it was proclaimed in multiple languages to people throughout the Roman Empire who could hear what they were saying in their own individual languages. The gospel from its very inception was intended to be multilingual, multi-ethnic, engaging a diverse group of people. Now, here at Pentecost, everybody that was gathered was basically um, coming from the Jewish religious tradition, whether or not they were Jewish ethnically, that they were Gentile, or, or they had converted and became proselytes of the Jewish people. So they, there wasn't as diverse as the Book of Acts actually gets, but linguistically and geographically, people gathered from all over the Roman Empire, were gathered in Jerusalem to hear the gospel on the day of Pentecost from the very first time. 
Christianity was born in multiple languages. That was the way it was from its very, very first day. Then we see Acts 2, 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, which is a quote, which is Peter quoting Joel in his sermon. The quote of Joel ends with this verse, even though there is more to the line of the, the Old Testament. Acts 2.39 ends with this idea, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. So, one, Joel says everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And um, it ends with this idea, all who the Lord call will be saved. If we fast forward to the end, we see that the sermon actually ends where the Joel passage ends. Joel also ends that. In that last verse, Joel 2.32, says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But it also says, and salvation will be for all who the Lord calls. It intentionally balances this idea of calling on the Lord for salvation and responding to the Lord's call to salvation. So both and, and we see this in this passage, in the passages that are quoted in this idea of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, that it balances this seeking God for salvation and God seeking you to be saved. The first time the gospel is presented at Pentecost, it is presented intentionally to those who may be viewed as the enemies of Jesus and of God, the people the Jewish leaders, the Jewish crowds, and the Romans judged Jesus and declared him to be guilty and executed him. But God judged Jesus, declared him to be righteous, and resurrected him. The people's verdict over Jesus is in direct opposition to God's Jesus, who they killed, has been made both Lord and Savior by God the Father. So, not only was the first time the gospel presented, presented in multiple languages to a diverse sort of people from throughout the Roman Empire, it was pre presented in Jerusalem 40 days, 50 days after Easter. This idea that the gospel was presented in the same town where Jesus was crucified to maybe many of the very same people who shouted for him to be crucified. The first offer of salvation was to the very people who killed Jesus. The place where the crucifixion happened was also the place where salvation was offered. So when we say it is available to anyone and everyone, it is available even to those who had some sort of role and responsibility with the execution and crucifixion of Jesus. Those who judged Jesus as unrighteous, as worthy of death, who judged him as that, they were the very first ones to be offered forgiveness for that judgment and asked to repent of that judgment and join God's opinion of Jesus as the righteous Lord and Savior of the world. So that is significant. So anybody and everyone from anywhere and everywhere is offered the gospel. Also, even those who were enemies of God and were held some responsibility in the death of Jesus were offered um, salvation as well. Peter, Peter specifically wants the crowd to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins, especially the sin of of opposing God's dis chosen Messiah, Jesus. If they do this, then they will receive the Holy Spirit promised by Joel and demonstrated by the actions of the disciples at that moment. So that is the gospel that Peter presents. That's the offer of salvation to those very people who could have been held responsible for Jesus' death from all over the world. Peter it first preaches the gospel to those very people. So looking at some questions to think about on this. Are you surprised that Peter tells the crowd at Pentecost to repent and be baptized? 
would you have worded the invitation at the end of the first sermon differently? Would you have said, you know, something else for the people to do? Repent and believe. Repent and confess. Or, you know, believe and be baptized. Something like that. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Commit your life to, you know, invite Jesus into your heart. We have a lot of these phrases. The first one in the first sermon that Peter uses is repent and be baptized. Does that take you by surprise? What does it mean that the gospel is first preached and salvation is first offered to the very people in the very same town that crucified Jesus? And the last question, who would you be surprised to see come to faith in Jesus? In your life, who would surprise you if they tomorrow told you that they had become a Christian? So, Great questions. Think about them. If you have any comments that you want to share, drop down in the comment section. I would love to hear from you on some of these engage in conversation. As always, there are three ways to join in person Sunday nights at 5 p.m. in the gym at live Monday night, 7 p.m. via Zoom. These weekly wrap ups on YouTube and or WordPress. I'm all over the social media, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, WordPress and YouTube. Would love to continue this conversation on those social media platforms as well. Like, subscribe, and follow however you're watching this, however you're engaging with this content. I really enjoyed this lesson, lesson two of the series. Hope you join us again for lesson 